Hello there everybody, my name's Terry, I'm the board modeler, and this is the Kugi Show P1Y1 Ginga, or Francis, by Hasegawa in 1 to 70 second scale. This is what I'll be reviewing in this video, so let's get the box open, take a look at what we've got, and then let's get started. Let's start off by taking a look at what we get in the box. And the first thing you'll notice is that there are a lot of parts sprues. It may look slightly intimidating at first, but after a bit of poking around, you'll soon find that the parts are organised, and fairly cleverly at that. For instance, sprues A and B give you the fuselage, the two F sprues provide the parts for the engines, and the D sprues give you the stabilizers, bombs and landing gear. In addition to that rather nice touch, the parts are cleanly moulded, with recessed panel lines and smooth surface detail. Overall, I'm pretty pleased with the quality of the 85 parts that make up this kit. I'm equally pleased with the instructions. They're fairly easy to follow, the illustrations are clear, and by putting the paint chart on the back of the instructions rather than in the middle, you don't have to go flipping forwards and backwards every time you start a new sub-assembly. The decals in the kit are nicely printed, although they are a bit on the thick side, and provide markings for two bombers. That said, I don't plan on using most of them. The markings on Japanese aircraft during World War II were fairly simplistic, and easy to replicate with paint. But that's probably enough about what's in the box. Let's get to building, shall we? This being an airplane kit, construction begins, you guessed it, in the cockpit. Specifically, I start off by attaching the radio equipment, and then I mask off and glue in the armoured glass divider behind the pilot's seat. While the glue dries, let's turn our attention to the cabin floor, which, once flipped over, gives us the top of the bomb bay. The bay has several pin marks which need to be filled and sanded. Fortunately, they're on the edges of the part, so there's less risk of damaging details as I smooth things out. With the pin markings smoothed out, it was time to put the interior of the aircraft together. I started off by gluing the cockpit onto the main cabin floor, which was then followed by the mount for the rear machine gun. Once that was in, the interior was mostly complete, so I decided to start painting it. I gave everything an undercoat of Tamiya's gloss aluminium lacquer, which will act as a natural metal base for the paint chipping to follow. I won't go into too much detail on the process here, because I'm working on a dedicated tutorial, which should hopefully be online by the time this video is, but after leaving the lacquer to cure overnight, I give the interior a coat of hairspray, And, after leaving that to dry for a couple of minutes, I paint the main interior colour, Vallejo's Pale Green. This colour's a bit greener than the IJN cockpit colour recommended in the instructions. That said though, reference photos of Japanese aircraft cockpits show them varying in colour from green to khaki to a sort of greyish teal. So, while pale green may not be exactly right, it's not exactly wrong either. Anyway, now that I've finished painting the cockpit green, 
I use an old paintbrush to re-wet and chip the paint in areas where it's most likely to wear out. Once I've got an effect I'm happy with, I protect everything with a lacquer clear coat. I gave the protective clear coat a day to dry, and then started adding the decals for the cockpit instruments. This turned out to be a bit more challenging than I was expecting owing to how thick the decals are in this kit. In order to get them to bend around the side instrument panels, I needed to use several applications of setting solution and some additional pushing with a cotton bud to get the decals to bend and stick around the 90 degree angle. To be honest, these weren't the worst decals I've ever put on a model, but considering how precise the plastic parts have fitted together thus far, I will say I was expecting something a bit better. Because they were going on flat surfaces, the decals for the radio equipment behind the pilot seat were much easier to apply. The main thing you have to take care of here is to trim the excess film off the sides of the decal, otherwise the decal might be too big to fit on its designated box. With the decals and paint chipping complete, the only major parts left to add to the cabin were the three seats. The detail on the seats was a bit basic, but having compared them to pictures I found of the real aircraft's cabin, they matched pretty well. And, as was seemingly the norm for this kit, the fit was precise and very secure once the glue was dry. After the seats were in place, I finished them off by painting the leather cushion on the pilot's seat. The freshly painted seats didn't quite blend in with the weathered interior, so I used a sponge dipped in silver paint to add some chips and scratches. I finished off my weathering by giving the interior a dark brown wash to emphasise the detail. And then I finished off the interior itself by attaching the pilot's control wheel and the rear machine gun. With the interior pretty much complete, I'll turn my attention to the two 500kg bombs that this aircraft carries. Each bomb comes in three parts, a top half, a bottom half and a square shaped tail section. As with the interior, these parts fitted together almost perfectly, and each bomb only required a small amount of filler to get the seams completely smooth. The bombs weren't just easy to construct either, they were easy to paint as well. By pushing a toothpick through the tail fin of each bomb, they stayed firmly in place as I airbrushed on a coat of black paint. And as I added some weathering, using reddish brown paint and another sponge, to add small spots of rust on each bomb. In hindsight, I'm not really sure how accurate this is, but I figure that a combination of wartime material shortages, and a combination of these bombs being stored and transported around the sea, would have led to at least some corrosion developing by the time they reached the front line, even if it wasn't quite to the extent I've depicted here. After the paint on the bombs had dried, I super glued them into place on the underside of the cabin floor, and then attached the now completed interior to one of the fuselage halves.
This did deviate somewhat from the instructions, which said to put the bombs in after the fuselage was fully assembled. However, given the narrow lines of the Ginga's fuselage, I decided it would probably be easier to glue the bombs into the bay first, before closing up the fuselage. Having to glue one of the bombs in place after I knocked it out of the fuselage with the model nearly done, basically confirmed my theory. Before closing up the fuselage, there's one last thing we have to do. This particular variant of the P1Y had a vertical antenna on the back of the aircraft. To attach it, I use a craft knife to open up the correct mounting hole for the antenna, as specified in the instructions. We'll worry about putting the antenna in place a bit later on, because now it's time to finish off the fuselage by attaching the other half. Normally this is where you'd expect to run into problems, like parts not lining up or fitting together correctly. But, as with the interior and the cockpit and the bombs and, well, pretty much everything up to this point, I couldn't find any issues with the fit of the Ginga's fuselage halves. There were a couple of places, particularly around the cockpit, where the fuselage halves didn't quite align correctly, but these were fairly inconspicuous, and only required a little filling and sanding to get them smooth. While the glue on the fuselage was drying, I put the wings together. This was another easy task, thanks to how precisely the parts in this kit were going together. The complete lack of any fit issues meant that I made short work of both wings. and I was soon ready to attach the rear section of the engine cowlings. These also fitted pretty well, but due to the location of the sprue attachment points being on the surface of the part rather than on the inside, they did need a bit more attention, and a bit of putty, to get them perfectly smoothed out. While the glue and the putty on the wings was drying, I worked on the cockpit canopy and the windows on the nose. Because of how small the windows were, I had to mask the clear parts off camera, but fortunately I am able to show you the nose mounted cannon going in place, and the clear parts going into place on the model. I was a bit nervous at this point, because other reviews of this kit noted the nose parts were slightly wider than the fuselage, but Hasegawa must have fixed those problems since then, because the nose section and canopy fitted perfectly on this model. Well, sort of. I think I must have glued the rear machine gun in place a little higher up than it should have been, because it started to push up the back of the canopy. Fortunately, the application of a little extra glue, and the use of a slightly oversized clamp, kept everything solid and properly aligned. So, with both the fuselage and wings needing time to dry at this point, all I really had left to work on was the landing gear. Each of the main tyres came in two halves, which I'm not really a fan of to be honest, because it leaves a rather noticeable seam right down the centre of each wheel, which requires a bit more filling and sanding than a one-piece tyre. The landing gear legs also came in multiple parts, but unlike the tyres, they fitted together near perfectly. I'm not 100% sure what the landing gear actually looks like on this aircraft, as most of the reference images either showed the plane with the gear up, or were so old that the details couldn't be clearly made out. That said, the landing gear in the kit does look pretty close to what I saw, and once all the glue's dry, the completed assembly is impressively strong. Oh, and if you're worried about those large triangular sections on top looking a bit unrealistic, don't worry about them too much. They're almost completely hidden once the gear's in the aircraft, and even when you're looking directly into the wheel well, they're still pretty hard to see. Right, the fuselage and wings are now dry, and I'm finally ready to combine those sub-assemblies into one aircraft. Unfortunately, the joint between the wings and the fuselage left a pretty sizeable gap. The wing to fuselage join is probably the most significant fit problem I've had with this kit, 
but even then, I've had to deal with a lot worse in other models. So, while I sort it out, let me tell you a bit more about this relatively obscure Japanese bomber. And it really is an interesting story, which begins in around 1942, when the Imperial Japanese Navy identified the need for a bomber to replace their Mitsubishi G4Ms. As outlined in Specification 15 Shi, the new bomber would have to have equal range to the outgoing Betty, a bomb load of 1,000 kilograms, and most importantly, a top speed that allowed it to keep up with the Zero fighter. The project was undertaken by the Yokosuka Naval Air Technical Arsenal, or Kugisho as it was sometimes known. The design team, headed up by aerodynamicist Tadanao Miki, gave the aircraft a slim aerodynamic fuselage and specified two Nakajima Homare engines to power it. However, it was these engines which caused the most grief to the P1Y program. The Homare engine was very much a prototype as the bomber was being designed, and issues with reliability and power output pushed the P1Y's first flight to August 1943, almost a year behind schedule. The new aircraft was officially named Ginga, meaning Galaxy in Japanese, and finally entered service in October 1944. Unfortunately, the power plant problems and production delays meant the Ginga was flying into a very different war to the one it was designed for. By 1944, the United States, with their famous big blue blanket of Corsairs and Hellcats, dominated the Pacific skies. The Ginga's high speed and heavy payload had come at the cost of heavy firepower and protective armour. And, as the situation got more desperate for Imperial Japan, many P-1Ys were pressed into service as kamikaze planes. In large-scale kamikaze missions, like the Tan-2 raid, the Gingas did successfully inflict damage on American ships, including at least one aircraft carrier. But the self-destructive tactics were unsustainable, and by the time the war was over, there were very few P-1Ys left. Only one survives today, albeit in parts and awaiting restoration, at the Smithsonian. But the Ginga's legacy was far more than an ultimately unsuccessful bomber, because its chief designer, Tadanao Miki, survived the war and got a job with the Japanese National Railways. He was employed as an aerodynamicist to work on a new kind of train, the high-speed Shinkansen, or bullet train. The design and construction of the first bullet trains drew heavily on Japan's experience with aircraft during the war, and Tadanao's work with the P-1Y certainly played a part in influencing the design of the aerodynamic train carriages. So, even though Mr. Tadanao and his high-speed bomber didn't turn the tide of World War II, the success of high-speed rail owes a lot to this obscure Japanese bomber and its talented designer. And now that the wing joints are all smoothed out, I'll put together the underwing fuel tanks, and move on to the nicely detailed engines. Unlike the engines on the real aircraft, I didn't run into any issues here. In fact, I was quite pleased with the end result and I especially liked Hasegawa's use of a vinyl cap to hold the propellers in place, as this allows the props to be removed from the engines to make painting, or transporting the finished model, a lot easier. Once the glue was dry on the engines, it was time to paint. The painting technique I use on this model is discussed in a lot more detail in my tutorial video on hairspray chipping, so, to avoid repeating myself, I'll leave a link to that video. For now though, I will say that painting this model was fairly easy, as the paint scheme is practically identical for both decal options. If you want to practice your airbrushing or weathering techniques, then this kit, with its large simple shapes and basic two-colour paint scheme, might be an ideal candidate. Provided, of course, you don't mind masking off the dozens of tiny windows, and you aren't phased by the price tag but we'll get to that later on. For now, it's time for me to correct something I said at the start of the video. You might remember that I was planning to mask and paint the red Hinomaru markings on the wings and fuselage, 
rather than using the kit supplied decals. Unfortunately, the sticky backed paper I was using to mask off the roundels kind of let me down here. Despite using a fresh knife blade in my circle cutter, the edges of the mask were torn and fuzzy, and it kept lifting off the model. After looking at my results, it didn't take me too long to realise that I should just use the decals instead. So I painted over the roundels with another layer of green, and carried on with my chipping plan, after making a note to pick up some better masking paper for my next project. Fortunately, the yellow panels on the leading edge of the wings were much easier to paint, and after airbrushing those, chipping the paint, attaching the completed engines and putting the cowlings over the top, and giving the model a clear coat it was onto the decals and let me tell you, as frustrating as my failed airbrushing attempt was the decals in this kit might just be more infuriating than that remember how when I was doing the instrument panels I said the decals were a bit on the thick side well, that was bad enough on a flat panel. On the wings, fuselage and tail surfaces, the decals simply refused to conform to panel lines and rivet detail. Even after multiple applications of setting solution, the roundels still obscured the panel lines, and the aircraft number on the tail somehow managed to cover up the gap between the stabiliser and rudder. Now that's bad enough, but some of the markings, like the white stripes on the horizontal stabilisers, turned out to be surprisingly brittle as well. I apologise if I'm coming off as overly critical here, but given the high quality of the plastic parts and the relatively easy construction up to this point, having decals this problematic is a real letdown. Anyway, once my battle with the decals had finished, I decided to add a bit more weathering to the model. Not only would this tone down the contrast between colours and help the model look a bit more well used and realistic, but it would also cover up the areas where I damaged the decals during application. I used a combination of black, white and brown oil paints to simulate streaks of dust and fluid building up on the aircraft, and a sponge dipped in silver paint to simulate freshly exposed metal. As with any weathering technique, it's important to do a small section at a time and take frequent breaks. That helps to make sure you don't overdo it and end up with a model that looks completely decrepit. Unless that's what you're going for, of course. I might have gone a bit overboard on mine, but considering how worn out some Japanese aircraft looked by 1945, the weathering on my P1Y is at least plausible. I hope. Once I'd finished my weathering and sealed it in with a flat clear coat, it was only a matter of putting the sub-assemblies together and touching up the paint. Seriously, it only took me about an afternoon to finish the rest of this build. I'd painted the landing gear components in gloss aluminium along with the rest of the aircraft. All that was left to do for them was paint the tyres, and then complete the landing gear by attaching all the parts to the aircraft. If done correctly, the main landing gear legs are so precisely moulded that they basically snap into place. It's really satisfying actually, and the assembly is nice and strong. The main wheels aren't quite as tight a fit as that, but they still go into place well, and once the glue's dry, 
they do a decent job of keeping the aircraft off the ground. With the aircraft now standing on its own, it was time to attach the bomb bay doors. These are moulded in the closed position and you have to cut them open into four separate panels if you want to display the bombs inside. You'll likely have to do a bit of cutting even if you want them closed, because when I test fitted the doors earlier, I found that they were actually slightly wider than the fuselage. I guess Hasegawa wanted the builder to display the aircraft with the bomb doors open, but if so, why mould them closed? I'm not sure, but I will say that when they're open, the doors fit in place really well. Also, make sure to read the instructions when you're attaching them. The large forward doors retract into the fuselage when open, rather than hanging down. I found that out the hard way. While the glue dried on the bomb doors, I finished off the propeller assemblies. Each prop comes in three parts. The hub, the blades, and the aerodynamic spinner on the front. All three parts fit together beautifully, and the vinyl caps hidden in the engine assemblies do a great job of holding the completed propellers securely in place. Now all that's missing are three small and very fragile parts. Fortunately, they're not too hard to attach. We'll start off with the barrel of the nose-mounted cannon, which gets glued into place on the end of the, well, nose. Next up is the radio loop antenna, which fits quite snugly into that hole we made in the top of the fuselage. And now, there's... wait, did I say three parts earlier? Because I meant four. There's a pitot tube on the end of the wing, and this aerial on top of the canopy, which I nearly forgot about. I'm adding a final detail in the form of this elastic thread to simulate the wire antenna. It is a bit fiddly to attach, but once I've got it in place, it looks quite nice. More importantly, the build's all done. I've got some touching up to do on the paintwork, so while I do that, how about we look at the review scores? As usual, we start off with the parts. They were very nicely moulded, with pretty much no flash or imperfections. But the lack of detail really did give away the fact that this kit's almost 30 years old. Still, I did appreciate the quality of the moulding, and the fact that the parts were grouped by subassembly, rather than scattered all over the sprues as they are in some other kits. Therefore, I've given the parts a 4.5 out of 5. As usual, we start off with the parts. They were very nicely moulded, with pretty much no flash or imperfections, but the lack of detail really did give away the fact that this kit's almost 30 years old. Still, I did appreciate the quality of the moulding, and the fact that the parts were grouped by subassembly, rather than scattered all over the sprues as they are in some other kits. Therefore, I've given the parts a 4.5 out of 5. The instructions were clear, concise and very well illustrated. I especially liked the fact that the construction stages were on one side of the sheet and the painting diagram was on the other. This meant I wasn't constantly flipping between the two every time I needed to check the colour of something. The only change I would make to the instructions is to separate the two marking schemes a bit more clearly. Because of how similar they are, it was easy to get confused between the two. But overall, the instructions did a good job of showing you how to build this kit. That's why I've given them a 4 out of 5. Now let's talk about construction. And honestly, I'm running out of superlatives to describe just how well this kit went together. Almost all the parts fit perfectly, without any further attention required. And even when parts required cutting, filling or sanding, it was fairly minimal compared with other kits I've built. In case you haven't guessed, construction gets a 5 out of 5. If only more kits were this easy to put together, it'd make the hobby a lot more accessible to beginner modellers.
Unfortunately, I can't say the same for the kit's decals. A combination of being too thick to conform to the kit's details without a lot of effort, and also being too brittle to withstand the sort of effort required to get them onto the model, made these decals, as I said before, a real letdown. If you're building this kit, get some aftermarket decals or make your own, because, as the rating shows, the ones that come in the box don't really meet my expectations. Those expectations were set quite high, considering this kit's price tag. I couldn't find an exact price online, but the retail price at the shop I bought mine from was about $52.99 Australian. That works up to about $38.83 in the US, or $32.72 in Euros. Either way, it's a lot to spend on what is ultimately a fairly petite model of a fairly obscure aircraft. I bought mine during a 50% off sale, and honestly, I'd consider that a reasonable price to pay for this kit. But at full price? Well, if you're interested in the subject matter, then this is probably a bargain compared to a limited run kit or a resin model. But if you just want to build a Japanese aircraft, you might want to consider something that's a bit better value for money. So, once we add all those scores together, we get a total of 18 out of 25, which is pretty good. In fact, it comes in second on the leaderboard, just one point behind Italeri's F-22. That's pretty good, given that this is a kit of a fairly niche subject, but a lower price and an improved decal sheet would make this kit almost perfect. That's all I've really got to say for this model. I hope you enjoyed the video and maybe even learnt something. If you've got any feedback, be sure to leave a comment or a like. And why not subscribe if you're interested in seeing more review videos like this. Anyway, my name's Terry, I've been the board modeler, and this is the Kugisho P1Y1 Ginga by Hasegawa in 1 to 70 second scale. Thanks for watching, stay safe, and happy modeling.